Financial Planner, Flow on YouTube. Dave and Eric, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thanks for having me on. It's good to be here again. Always great talking to you, Dave. All right. Now Likewise. Let's start, let's start with uh, Dave. And uh, regarding the precious metals markets, you recently wrote a piece saying that you think precious metals are bottoming. Can you expand on that? Oh, no. I think I think, I think Bitcoin's the new gold. So, you know, <laughs> I've moved on. <laughs> Did you sell your newsletter? <laughs> <laughs> no, I sold all my gold and silver, though. <laughs> that definitely Don't forget to hog the couch and put some more in Bitcoin. I'm gonna I'm gonna roll out my own crypto coin. I think everyone else seems to be doing it. Dave <laughs> coin. <laughs> I don't know what I'll call it. <laughs> so you um, see, uh, precious metals crashing further than Dave. <laughs> yeah, everyone's rushing to cryptos. No, as a matter of fact, um, I actually have a. Uh, it's a little over a page of analysis for my mining stock journal subscribers that I'm going to release tonight, and it talks about um, a lot of the. It, it talks about why the narrative that Bitcoin is the new gold is total nonsense, and I have some some good statistics in there um, on physical gold demand, both retail and um, global. And also, I, I, I do an analysis. When a lot of people like to look at the charts or they look at, you know, they say, well, the last three or four years, you know, after the middle of December, gold has positive returns. So there's, there's certainly um, there's a pattern there that we've seen for the last three or four years. And I, you know, I actually am not happy that everyone's jumping on that pattern because it, to me it kind of means like, yeah, well, that, that may already be priced into the price of, of gold at this point because everyone's positioned expecting that pattern to repeat. And whether or not that's the case or not, that'll remain to be seen. Um, what I like to do is I like to look at the commitment of traders report and I look at the overall open interest level and then the net short position of the banks, essentially, which, uh, you know, Listeners might know them as as being the commercial category, and, and the um, the the hedge funds, which is essentially the large speculators. But it's it's mostly hedge funds in there, and the, the hedge funds are always net long. They're always they're always playing the the momentum in 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 paper gold, and the the banks are always net short. So. Um, we had reached an, a pretty extreme level, and I'm looking at historical numbers. We have my partner keeps a database of the COT reports that go back to goes back to May of 2005. So we have a lot of data. Um, and when I in September, I we put a hedge on in the equity portfolio in our fund because the open interest was getting high relative to historicals, you know, historical averages. And the net short position of the banks was getting extremely high, and the net long position of the hedge funds is getting extremely high. What happens is the banks start bombarding the market. They trigger the sell stops that the hedge funds have automatically set in their computer black boxes, and and they they um, push the market lower that way. It's it, it helps. What helps them is that the hedge funds, for the most part, will automatically sell their long positions when the sell stops are triggered. And um, I mean, so the banks don't even have to short any more paper. They just go in there and they cover. And it's been a very profitable activity for the banks for, you know, at least the last 15 years. So um, I did some analysis and crunch numbers last night, and we're at the point right now where the open interest has almost, you know, it's it's come down quite a bit from its peak um, earlier this fall. Um, and I don't have the numbers right in front of me, so I, I can't give you the, the exact numbers. But um, essentially, the open interest level is probably about twenty to 30,000 contracts above kind of the 15-year average for the open interest in gold. Um, so it's 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 bled off a lot, and then the net short position of the commercial banks 
um, has come down. It's still a little bit above historical norms and um, or the historical average. And same thing with the hedge fund net long position. It's it's you know 20 to 30 thousand contracts above its historical long. So based on that data, I think we're pretty close to a bottom. I don't know if we're there quite yet. I, I think I think the banks are probably use the the Christmas holiday period, which is when India and China also seem to hibernate for a couple of weeks. So there won't be pressure from the physical market. Um, and I think they'll they'll make one last push to take gold lower, get their shorts covered, and then we'll restart the cycle again. So that that's kind of what I'm basing my view of um, of whether or not we bottomed. Um, I did sit. I did mention my subscribers in September that I was kind of thinking it would the market would have to come down to about 1240. And again, I'm not, a, I'm not I don't put a lot of faith in charts, but I was just kind of looking at the charts um, and seeing where the moving averages were, et cetera. And um, it, it just kind of looked like at the time, I think gold was around 1320. And it, it just looked like it was going to take taking down the market to kind of the 1230 to 1240 area before um, this this cycle um, had finished cycling through. So um, that's why I'm kind of expecting one more hit. I think I think we'll see one more shock and awe where they try to freak people out and get people to sell. And then and then onward and upward for a while. Eric, what is your yeah. do you think we're going to see one more hit before we bottom? I don't think we're going to see a big hit, um, but what Dave is speaking about is actually something that can happen without a lot of price downward action, uh, because it's it, the bullion banks basically have the, the way that that our audience can think about it is that they're managing a book and they accumulate uh, their short positions, uh, get an average uh, exposure, and then they try to shed those short positions over time, and it's kind of a churning process. We, we in our in our sector joke about it as the wash, rinse, repeat cycle. And that we are down where we are right now, combined with a, a lot of rising interest for physical gold will make it such that we're probably just going to just bottom bounce around. And that will – it's not like some kind of downward capitulation dive that would mark a bottom, but still not – really get anywhere until we get through to January. That's the pattern that we've seen for three some odd years now. Uh, I, I've spoken a lot about this pattern and have been partially responsible for getting people to see it, and I totally understand what Dave is speaking about, being a little bit nervous about the fact that people are recognizing this pattern now. We're seeing, uh, in fact, a, a little bit earlier interest in gold and silver this year versus a couple of the other years. So... I, you know, last year we saw precious metals fly into January. As soon as January turned, you know, the markets rocketed higher, and then all of a sudden they stalled out again. And we marked time through mid-January and, and didn't really get very far until later in the month and, and, and then later on in the year. We'll probably see something like that this time around, but it's harder to get a sense as to what's going to be the, the kind of pattern that the uh, – rising interest in the market will meet when it comes to what the cartel and, and other pressures to, to keep a lid on, on prices, because the, the psychology is probably going to be a little bit different this year. So the timing of how things unfold will be a little bit different. But the reality is, is that precious metals are the most undervalued asset um, in the world. And there's a lot of money flying around. And, and we've been in a nine plus year duration move, both with the artificial economic still stimulus and the resuscitation of financial assets uh, from all of this liquidity that's been dumped in the market. And as each each quarter passes, more and more people that are professional investors are looking around deciding, I really need to have some insurance. And, and the flow and interest in precious metals is kind of subterranean, but it's there. It's being you know, drowned out by all the attention that people are paying to Bitcoin and all the other cryptocurrencies. But this stock market is just, it's partially an illusion. And so is the economy underneath it. And we're going to see people move more and more towards precious metals just by a sheer, you know, small percentage of this Titanic flow. Um, I was on Dave Janda's show on Friday talking, or sorry, Sunday, last Sunday, speaking about how the FX market 
has been partially responsible for what's making Bitcoin explode. And Zero Hedge is talking about that today. I mean, it's it, it, we're living in a world where this fiat paradigm has uh, sometimes as much as six trillion dollars worth of notional value flying around in the in the foreign exchange markets. There's so much hot money that everything's getting distorted and and that's one of the reasons why we've seen this explosive move in bitcoin uh, it's somewhat of a distraction i mean bitcoin's move is probably the biggest bubble in human history other than you know tiny little things that can fly around like a penny stock or whatever that's manipulated i mean the the, the bitcoin asset in and of itself is such a different animal that the market is reacting very differently Right, and turning to Dave, what do you make of the recent make- price action in Bitcoin? <laughs> it's it's nothing like I've ever seen. Definitely, I yeah, mean, they- I don't think I've ever seen. I haven't been, uh, you know, in the yeah, in sector the- for so long. You know, yeah. paying attention to the, all these financial things, I'm I'm relatively new in, in all this. Um, just the last, you know, five, six, seven years, but I've never seen any asset just fly like Bitcoin has. You haven't seen any asset because there hasn't been any asset in the history of the world that's gone as parabolic as Bitcoin has. Yeah. Now, it's 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 a lose lose for me to say anything about Bitcoin other than oh, oh buy until you know mortgage your house and buy it because the the Bitcoin faithful they'll just uh, you're gonna you'll see it in the comments on this podcast there you know uh, I'll get attacked but just to be clear I'm not trying to discourage anyone from buying Bitcoin or any of these cryptos. I just think that you need to know what you're getting into because it's not a level playing field. It's it's highly skewed toward the accounts that control a very significant percentage of the Bitcoins. And when you put your give your money to a coin exchange, you you know, you they'll be happy to sell you all the Bitcoins you want with your money. But when you go to sell it, it takes several weeks to get your money out. I know Coinbase has, I know for at least $50,000 accounts, there's a $15,000 a week minimum or maximum withdrawal. So, um, again, I, I just think, you know, whether or not there's any legitimacy to the asset class, and I'm not saying that there isn't, I have my opinions on it, but I'm not saying that there isn't. Time will tell. Um, There certainly hasn't been enough time to tell whether or not it's a legitimate asset class. But by the same token, I think that if you get into Bitcoin now, you know, you might get a ride higher, but how are you going to know where to sell? Um, And I think a lot of people who are buying it at these levels ultimately are going to get burned. So um, it reminds me a lot, you know, especially with all these different cryptos that are being floated out there. Um, you know, I heard about a couple more today. Um, you know, it's it's really not that much different from a fiat currency. And it reminds me of the dot-com era because I was day trading tech stocks back then. And, um, you know, every day there'd be a handful of uh, literally websites that would go public. And the stock yeah. would go from public at 10, go to 100. And then six months later, the company would be out of business. So I would bet that 99.5% of the of the dot coms that went, went public between say 98 and, and early 2000 are were out of business within three to five years. Um, I, I do think there's legitimacy to the blockchain technology, and I think ultimately. Um, Countries and central banks will will issue their own, own cryptocurrency, and that that's that's the tool that'll be used to convert the Western financial system into a cashless system. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more, and and that really is the long term risk when it comes to trying to figure out what could happen to Bitcoin. I'm generally within the libertarian community. I consider myself mostly a uh, minarchist and libertarians hate it when i speak about what could happen to bitcoin in the future it's it that bitcoin has a, a target on its back governments are intending to co-opt it to use the blockchain technology for their own purposes and it's kind of a race actually i mean bitcoin is never going to die but it could be m- marginalized away to the point of not necessarily being a functional uh, ex- means of exchange and general commerce and that diminishes its ability to serve as a 
currency. I mean, it, it has store value functionality, yes, but what Dave pointed out as far as being able to actually turn it into something that you can more easily spend, it, it, that's a problem. I mean, people need to understand that Bitcoin, yes, could go to 50,000 within six months if we have a stock market correction. It doesn't take all that much for this gigantic flow of capital to land on Bitcoin, which represents the majority of the market capitalization of the entire crypto sector. So you have this singular currency asset that's all of a sudden like a honeypot and a trillions, literally, of dollars worth of notional value flying around the markets. And all you need is a small rivulet out of that flow to just blow up the asset and cryptocurrencies bitcoin is a currency it's a different animal it's a very different thing than say watching the s p 500 universe of equities uh capturing the imagination of a bunch of worldwide money managers tossing 500 billion dollars around in half a year or whatever to create a bubble no bitcoin the reason why bitcoin went from a thousand to 19 plus thousand within this year alone is because it's a very different animal and people need to understand that because of the nature of what the asset is it's going to be unbelievably volatile so uh speculation yeah like it's it's nice if somebody really wants to go to the casino <laughs> and and also bitcoin does have you know some in, insurance value as a store of value but People need to understand that the entire sector does have a target on its back, and the powers that be are going to eventually try to co-opt it for their own purposes. So uh, it, it's not wise to be Pollyannish when it comes to recognizing all of the nice features that the technology does, in fact, have. And, and blockchain technology by itself, never mind the currency, is a wonderful technology, you know, transaction coding, etc. So. It'll be an interesting sector to watch, but anyone who's like dumping all of their precious metals ex uh, exposure and insurance simply to ride a speeding bullet uh, is probably making a pretty big mistake because they're not thinking about it in the right terms. You know, portfolio management uh, and diversification are wonderful things, but from what I'm seeing, the, the mania out here now, I mean, I'm hearing people just like jettisoning their stock portfolios and all their gold and then buying Bitcoin, selling the furniture. <laughs> Mortgaging the house, you know, it, it's it's crazy. This is a really big bubble, but it can get a lot, lot more bubblicious, and we're going to see it. And I would not be surprised if we see in both. I would not be surprised if we see seven thousand Bitcoin within the next month. It's, it's entirely possible, as well as you know, fifty thousand in the next six months. That's how crazy Bitcoin can get. Well, I just want to add, Eric, um, you know, I, I don't know that it's necessarily a tested store of value yet. I mean, with that type of volatility, and I agree with you on the potential yeah. volatility band, you can't really call it a store of value yet. It's just, like I said, it's it's, just, an it's untested. Store of value. You know, <laughs> I, I call me old-fashioned, but I, I prefer the asset that has 5,000 years test of time yeah. as a store of value. Um, and also, it's it's problematic. Once you own it, if you own a lot of it, it's problematic converting it back into fiat currency or, or you know, dollars or euros or whatever. It, it, takes, it takes a lot of time. I mean, these guys that are sitting on millions and millions of dollars for the Bitcoin, they don't have liquidity. And again, that, again, is um, a test of a store of value for me. How and, and reasonably low volatility as a function of store value is what, in fact, makes a currency useful in commerce. I mean, you know, companies trying to figure out how to uh, take retail sales from, from Bitcoin, look at it and scratch their head, and they recognize the regulatory burden with uh, the IRS taxing the currency. They don't tax dollars when people make a purchase. It's a, it's a, it's a quagmire for commerce at this point, and I mean, they're going to try to resolve all these things, but – then again, you know, the governments at the same time are attempting to co-opt that universe as well with their own inventions. So the next three years are going to be fascinating. And then somewhere in that three-year window, we are going to have a stock market crash. I mean, you know, forecasters like Dave and I always have a great difficulty in trying to figure out where the future is going to unfold. But within the next three years, we're going to have a stock market crash. <laughs> 
the, the kind of liquidity that's been holding up what we've seen in the market makes it such that it's almost a foregone conclusion and safe to say that you know we're not going to see a 12 year long duration move off of this uh, strange you know inflated economy creating all this uh, you know acid inflation everywhere we have bubbles everywhere definitely and looking at just a little bit into the future into 2018 just this last week we saw the fed uh do another rate hike it, it looks like next year they might do a couple more what is your perspective on the markets? I guess we can start with Dave um, in 2018, the stock market and the precious metal markets. Yeah, you know, I hate to put price targets on gold and silver because the market's so manipulated. Um, and, you know, I kind of stopped putting price targets. Of course, in the next sentence, I'll tell you what I had the subscriber asked me that yesterday, and I just said, look, I hate to put price targets on it, but I would not be surprised if gold is $200 higher than where it is right now by June. So, uh, um, I, you know, I think we're, I think you're going to see after, after India and China go through their dormant period, I think you'll see them back buying gold and silver with both hands. Um, I know that when the price has been taken down um, this past week, there was significant increase in buy activity coming from both India and China. So, um, you know, any any time that the, the the central banks try to take the price of gold down too far, India and China start buying physical with both hands, and they know that. And so, um, but anyway, that's I guess you know I can say that's my forecast for 2018. I really don't want to look past uh, June. Um, in terms of the stock market, I think it's going to be largely a function of of how aggressive the Fed gets and the EC. Well, I don't even know if the ECB has necessarily stated that they're going to withdraw liquidity from their or, or, or try and reduce their balance sheet. And who knows what the Bank of Japan is going to do? I mean, they, they've shown a capacity to print like crazy for the last 20 years. So, um I personally think, unless there's a reason that this, the Fed and the government decide that they, they want to let the stock market deflate, and I, I mean, I don't expect them to do that, I think that they're going to have to start printing money again um, well before the end of next year in order to um, keep the economy propped up or attempt to keep the economy propped up and to keep the stock market propped up. So, um, I mean, I'd like to say that, you know, my forecast is we're going to be a lot lower next year. But again, to me, it, it's all a function of the degree to which central bank intervenes. And that's a wild card. Eric, your forecast on the precious metal market, stock market, and what do you think the Fed will do going into 2018? Well, I, I, we're probably going to see the Fed come nowhere near the number of rate hikes that they're they're putting on their dot plot uh, communication to the financial markets and the media. And the economy is not going to be as strong as people are expecting. So, you know, we, we will see a lot of political pressure as well as just general recognition that the Fed is going to need to not be as aggressive in terms of trying to present an image of them. Um, Fixing their balance sheet from the mess that they've made in the last years, and the you know I mean the central bank in in, in Europe uh, the ECB you know, has been managed by Draghi pretty well. He's been able to convince people that they are going to try to taper their own balance sheet issues, but they can't because their banking system is a mess. Italy's in particular is really dangerous, so. The, the central bankers, left, right, and center, have a, a lot of checks against their ability to, to move in the direction they're telling everybody that they're going to move. And the, the financial markets you know, in that environment will no longer have uh, the, the central bankers you know, able to continue doing what they're doing without breaking expectations. That's the, the really important point to consider uh, because at some point, a lot of – conventional financial 
managers are going to want more and more uh, diversification into assets that are undervalued, that have not had these giant moves, and that are not so susceptible and vulnerable to weakening economic conditions, rising interest rates, pressurizing assets. I mean, when the Federal Reserve tries to normalize its balance sheet or at least talk a good game about it, that can put pressure on upwards momentum for interest rates. And we have so much credit out in the world that's going to squeeze everything. And it, it's going to be a process that will out itself over time, and we're going to see some of that happen in 2018, no matter what, I mean, if they try to raise interest rates anywhere near what they're talking about, that will crash the stock market or at least put it into major corrections. And those kind of conniption fits are going to support the gold market. Um, we saw gold hit uh, about 1360, a little above that back in September, and then just fade off. And, and I think we'll see move easily exceeding that, kind of what Dave's talking about, 1400. Uh, within this coming year, uh, I think his timing as well is is, is something that's an eminently uh, plausible given the way you know the the buying patterns happen in the East as well too. So uh, I think we're going to see gold probably get as high as maybe even as much as fifteen hundred if we have an equity market correction of substance, you know, ten fifteen percent, and I think that's coming. All if right. not a lot worse. And Eric Dubin, thank you so much for joining us today. Before we let you go, did you want to share with the viewers any last thoughts you had? And Dave, where can we find you online? Well, I don't, I don't even know what to think anymore about these markets. Just because referring to them as markets is incorrect. There's just so much intervention, and there's so little price discovery um, that it's it's. I feel like they're they're being toyed with like a like a puppet with the central banks being the puppeteers. So, um, uh, you know, I I personally think that it's the most dangerous market I've ever seen, and I've been doing this since the mid '80s. Um, and I, you know, for people who are invested in equities, I'd be very careful. I, I'd probably start looking for the exit because when everyone, as Eric said, I like the way he put it, it it'll out itself over time. When, uh, when everybody starts heading for the exits at once, there's not going to be any bid side liquidity. So, uh, um, uh, you know, I just, just caution people to be careful with these stock markets. I'm sure most of the Silver Doctor audience already knows that, though. Um, yeah, you can find my work at investmentresearchdynamics.com, and there's links there to the two newsletter products that I offer, the, the Mining Stock Journal and the Short Sellers Journal. And the next Mining Stock Journal issue is going to be re released tonight. And I've got a, a junior bite stock idea in there that I had never heard of before. And someone brought it to my attention just recently. And I looked at it and had a long conversation with management. They're going to be producing by late 2018 and I mean on a risk return basis it's not a 10 bagger but it is it's probably over the next year assuming the price of copper um, you know stays above two bucks which I think should be a no-brainer this thing should double or triple it's really highly undervalued relative to its intrinsic value Eric any last thoughts you'd like to add before we leave you it's going to be a pretty interesting year coming up, and we'll we'll try to cover it as best as we can on Silver Doctors. And uh, if anyone likes to follow our work, we can find us here on Silver Doctors and also find what I do as well privately on my Facebook account, facebook.com slash Eric Dubin.